So today's lecture is on uh, role of acute pain management in prevention of chronic pain. I normally give this lecture at the <clears throat> uh, chronic pain uh, workshop, and uh, you know the one it is held at towards the center. Let me start the uh, tab. Yeah. So 2017 was declared as the global year against uh, pain after surgery. And um, this is the man uh, who I actually chaired a session uh, around three years back in uh, Delhi Pain course and uh, this is Professor Stephen uh, Shug. He is Professor and Chair of Anesthesiology in the uh, School of Medicine and Pharmacology at the University of Western Australia. He is also Director of the Pain Medicine at the Royal Perth Hospital Australia. So he took a lecture on uh, what is the basis of uh, you know the chronic pain developing after an acute injury and that, that was very interesting and uh, this was followed by my lecture on uh, prevention of uh, the chronic pain. So it complemented uh, these lectures very well. And uh, he is also one of the authors of this uh, uh, publication, uh, The Acute Pain Management Scientific Evidence. And uh, this was pretty, uh, this was, uh, I think, uh, fourth edition, uh, which was uh, published in 2015. Coming back to the actual lecture, um, uh, what has this man got to do uh, with chronic pain? And this one, this young lady, and uh, this man. He was famous as you can now call he became notorious. Uh, so uh, going back to the slide, this man actually uh, everybody knows, and uh, he developed chronic pain following uh, severe uh, spine injuries that is sustained during uh, uh, filming of his one of his movies uh, shooting of one of his movies and um, this lady Angela Jolie uh, she had a double mastectomy for because she has got this uh, gene for which can makes her susceptible to developing uh, cancer this guy is a double amputee, and uh, he's jailed for killing his uh, girlfriend. So all these conditions, these are examples of conditions which can actually become chronic uh, after you have had some acute pain. Now this is a publication from 1872, uh, very long ago and is a typical description of chronic pain. So the case report actually says the wound healed in four weeks, which is normal. Ever since the wound began to heal, he has had great and increasing pain and numbness in the foot. These feelings seem to arise just above the wound and to run down to the toes. The pain is darting, pricking, and in the foot burning which are made worse by heat, dependence of food, etc. Now, this is a typical example of how a chronic pain would present. So this is from way back in 1872. So why, why does this worry us? Why is the chronic pain such an issue? So the problem with chronic pain is that it is one of the commonest causes for work loss and disability. Now, if you have chronic pain, you're not able to go to work, you feel disabled to actually do anything, enjoy your life, enjoy your work, and ultimately it leads to societal level, at societal level to financial burden because you're not earning, you're not paying taxes, you're not contributing to the society at all. At personal level, uh, the chronic pain leads to loss of mobility. Obviously, it's painful, uh, you cannot go to work, 
you might become depressed you can addict can addicted to opioids you might be on and it always lowers the quality of life so it is a help now a lot of efforts have been put into preventing heart disease and diabetes and but none into prevention of chronic pain so even though uh, 2017 was year of uh, the prevention of chronic pain but uh, there's not much uh, money popped into this not money um, you know efforts into this uh, been put alike in for diabetes and uh, heart disease and obviously now if the initial interventions fail then you at least start going for higher passive interventions such as polypharmacy and then implantable devices comes in then multiple injections and you have to attend physiotherapy physical therapy and even maybe have to undergo a surgery and uh, it's also interesting that any pain which lasts for more than uh, one month can persist up to around five years and this is despite uh, you having an extensive uh, treatment so persistent post surgical pain or chronic uh, post surgical pain is no good so what is the magnitude of the problem so if you look at the uh, post operative period almost 3 out of 4 patients that is almost 80% will present uh, with uh, pain severe pain okay so in uh, 2003 uh, Applebaum uh, actually did a uh, survey on acute post operative pain and then uh, in 2014, uh, GAN also published the same uh, study. So that was over the years. Has anything changed? Has the management of acute pain changed at all? Not at all. The, the incidence actually remains almost the same. It's down to almost 75% now. So even 75% of the patients who actually have had surgery still actually present in the uh, recovery. Uh, with uh, acute pain. It may not be some moderate to severe, uh, but most will present with some sort of pain. So we have some data from uh, like uh, in uh, from US. In US, more than uh, uh, 3,000 uh, patients, more than 3,000 patients per year uh, can develop chronic pain after surgery. And of this, 50% uh, of these, almost 150,000 patients uh, suffer from severe and disabling pain. So that is actually quite significant uh, in there. And now as we have some data from uh, UK as well, this is not very recent data. A lot of this data is still old. So in UK, there are 234 million surgeries per year, and the mortality from the pain is around 3 to 16%. So still uh, remain quite, quite high. Now, uh, this survey, which was uh, done uh, uh, you know, uh, of the 10 hospitals uh, based on pain clinics. And uh, this looked at data from uh, 1989 to 1992. So we're looking at the surgeries that can lead to chronic pain. And almost every every kind of surgery can like, lead to chronic pain. And of this, uh, surgery accounts to around 22.5% of the patients. Uh, trauma around 18.7%. So... Persistent post-surgical pain or chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, what are the incidents in individual things? So like amputation, it's very, very high. It's around 30 to 85 percent. Uh, thoracotomy, again, very high. Can vary anywhere from 5 to 67 percent. Uh, but even simple surgeries like inguinal hernias can present with uh, persistent post-surgical pain. Cholestectomies can present with post-surgical pain. Vasectomies. Any kind of surgery, you know, gynea laparotomy, 32%. Uh, bone graft, phallic bone graft, especially anterior phallic spine um, bone graft near that uh, is more painful than the posterior uh, bone graft. Hip replacement, 28%. Caesarean section, 12%. Hysterectomy, 25%. So all this, uh, you know, can present all kind of surgeries. So... You can actually look at the estimates. This is from another source from 2011. Uh, on the left side, you can see all the surgeries. On the right side, you have incidence of chronic pain. And estimated incidence of chronic pain in which uh, this is much higher, higher incidence. Okay. So almost every surgery can actually present as a persistent post-surgical pain. 
and even simple procedures uh, like in inguinal hernias can can present uh, with persons. So uh, almost uh, thirty percent of the hernia patients uh, can have persistent post surgical pain. Of this, uh, three percent can be moderate to severe. So this is this is actually is uh, a lot more serious uh, kind of pain. Uh, so what Shipton actually said, uh, this is uh, long back, uh, was that all chronic pain was once acute, right? I mean, this is this is important. So all chronic pain was once acute, but not all acute pain becomes chronic, right? So that's why we've seen that incidence can vary from anywhere from 15 to 80 percent in uh, some of the surgeries. So not all acute pain will become uh, chronic, so we must be doing something right. So on average, persistent post-surgical pain, uh, that is the pain of persistent pain after surgery, can be anywhere from 10 to 50%. And of this, 2 to 10% uh, chronic pain can be very severe. So we all know that uh, the unrelieved post-operative pain uh, can cause clinical and psychological changes. Okay, and this leads to increased morbidity and mortality. It increases the cost of treatment and obviously reduces the quality of life in the patients. So what is the solution and uh, what can we do to prevent? Obviously, we cannot uh, you know, take care of everything, uh, but it's important to understand what acute post-operative pain means. And it's a very common misconception amongst most people that acute post-operative pain is transient condition. It involves uh, physiological nociceptive stimulation with variable affective components, which we already know in the definition of pain. And they think that it differs markedly in pathophysiology based on chronic pain syndrome, which is absolutely wrong. So whatever actually happens during the acute post-operative pain can be seen in chronic pain. Or rather, what you see in chronic pain is present in the acute pain uh, conditions, right? So uh, this... Um, so we all know that tissue trauma leads to physical, cognitive, and emotional discomfort. This is the definition of pain. But if you look at the chemical mediators in acute pain, right, they are no different from what you see in chronic pain. So why should we be treating acute pain so differently from chronic pain? Why can't we be more aggressive in managing acute pain? So you look at all the, uh, the components, all of them, they, they say chronic pain. What is chronic pain? They say chronic pain is a soup of this, uh, you know, mediators which actually are present in this and that area. No, it's the same what's happening in acute pain. You cause tissue trauma, you release all these mediators. And these mediators persist throughout this period. So important thing is, is can we actually, you know, uh, predict which patients will develop chronic pain? Or more importantly, which patients will develop the persistent post surgical pain? So, uh, Kalkman uh, came up with this scoring system, and this is very, very interesting. So, we have a point system, we have uh, various components. So, of this, which you need to look at, we need to look at uh, the sex of the patient the age, uh, whether there was pain before surgery at the site, uh, whether the patient was on regular opioids, uh, patient on regular use of anxiolytic or antidepressants, whether it's an open surgery, uh, type of surgery, whether the patient is obese, and is there a high level anxiety at the preoperative visit. And now all you need is a score. This is total score is around 15, but all you need is a score of four. And look at if you are in pain before the surgery and if you're a female patient, young female patient. You have already scored five points, three from having severe pain or even moderate pain. 
And if you're in the age group of 31 to 65 years, you got one point. If you're a female, you get one point. So if you're a female, a young female, likely having, say, for example, breast surgery for some reason, uh, you have already. And uh, say, for example, even if it is not painful, it's a cancer surgery, you are going to be anxious, right? Some patients will become depressed because they have been diagnosed with cancer. So all these patients are actually in high category of developing chronic pain. This is a very important uh, you know, feature of that. If you look at types of surgery, thoracic abdominal surgery at least go higher than orthopedic surgery. I think uh, somatic pain is uh, much easier to manage. But if it's associated with uh, you know, ischemia, for example, like patients having uh, uh, you know, amputation for ischemic limb, they tend to develop chronic pain. But if it is a traumatic amputation, uh, say it happened in an accident, they don't. So the kind of, uh, you know, reason for uh, for the, you know, amputation uh, differs as well. And uh, if the patient is obese, BMI of 30, now a lot of patients walk around with BMI of 30. Uh, so you at least score one point immediately if you're on the obese side. And you can have you know, female patient, uh, young patient uh, is slightly on the on the bigger side, and has uh, undergoing a surgery. Well, all this uh, is not uh, going to be uh, good. So, how do we deal with this issue? Uh, it is it is like this. It looks like this. You know, pain, big thing. How can we understand this, poor guys? We <laughs> have to actually deal deal with pain day in day out. <laughs> uh, so. We know how to actually manage pain. That is one good thing. But what is more important is that we do not actually have the facility to follow up the patients. And we do not know what percentage of patients are developing this persistent post-surgical pain because they do not come back to us. We only provide anesthesia. We're not part of the, of the chronic pain teams or acute uh, you know, pain teams. Uh, some of us may be lucky to actually do that. Uh, for example, my surgeons, if they are, any of my patients actually have problem, they will actually let me know. Uh, also, electronic pain, uh, sorry, electronic systems, which actually, uh, you know, you can access uh, electronic notes from anywhere. That are also good to actually follow up your patient. And uh, we actually luckily have that facility too. So opium, opium, yes, opium is good. But here I'm not talking about morphine. This is an acronym. Opium is an acronym. Opium is an acronym for optimize, prevent, investigate, understand, and manage. And this, this obviously can be used for a lot of things and uh, uh, holds good for um, uh, the management as well. This is this is the acronym I developed. <laughs> so opium, so you optimize patients, you prevent pain, you investigate what's going on. And you need to understand what's going on with the patient and obviously manage accordingly. <clears throat> and we have to have a preventive strike. This is this is important. Now we have moved from preemptive to, to preventive. So preemptive and prevent preventive. So what exactly is, is preventive strike? So there is a role of something called preventive analgesia. Okay. <clears throat> So this was uh, uh, from uh, Center uh, from 2002. He said, this basically involved decreasing pain from tissue injury, which we are good at, okay, giving nerve block, giving local infiltration using techniques which reduce pain. And, but what we don't look at is, is preventing spinal sensitization. Can we actually prevent it? Are there medicines which are available to do that? And we started thinking those lines as well. Uh, things like you know introducing pregabalin or putting patients of pregabalin or gabapentin, these are important. Using ketamine, using NMDA receptor blockers. Okay, so these these are things, and and th then other is reducing the incidence of inflammation or chronic pain. Now, using anti-inflammatory, we use uh, like I've been promoting people to use dexamethasone and uh, non-steroidals. Uh, that is, if patients can tolerate it. dexamethasone, has got multiple uh, roles. It's not only actually anti-inflammatory; it also reduces the incidence of nausea and vomiting in the patient. So it makes their experience uh, good as well. Non-steroidal, again, you can actually give some of these non-steroid along uh, with PPIs, or some patients will tolerate it really well. And uh, and all you need to do is tell them that they need to actually use uh, non-steroidals uh, with food. 
So uh, we need to understand why this happens and how this happens. So acute pain becoming chronic, this is not a new concept. Uh, like uh, I've said uh, before, uh, whatever happens in uh, chronic pain, you see in acute pain. It's no different. It is basically the same process carrying on. You haven't actually put a stop to that process. Uh, so in 1913, uh, Kriel actually de uh, described or proposed that, that pain can cause scars in the central nervous system. Okay, this is what sensitization is, central sensitization as well as peripheral sensitization. If the noxious stimulus of surgery have unsuppressed access to the system. Okay, so uh, this is a very basic definition uh, of uh, what happens uh, if acute pain carries on. So acute pain becoming chronic pain uh, happens, uh, and uh, like I said, if the process is not stopped, or those inflammatory uh, mediators are not taken care of, and it's often of a neuropathic uh, kind. And the cause for this is basically maladaptive uh, neuroplasticity with sensitization. Sensitization which occurs not only peripherally, but also centrally. So there are chemical changes happening in the spinal cord, chemical changes happening in the brain. So it is it is both. It's peripheral as well as central, central sensitization. So this is a, a nice uh, kind of a flow, flow diagram, what happens with tissue injury. So we have got the peripheral row and we have got the central uh, row of the CNS. So tissue injury leads to release of arachnoid acid. Uh, that's where the COX-2 becomes important because they stop the prostaglandin synthesis and this prevent nociceptor uh, activation and thus prevention of peripheral sensitization and a primary hyperalgesia can be taken off. So a very simple thing. So you can actually use specific COX-2 inhibitors or non-specific like ibuprofen or even daclofenac, they are fine. So you are preventing the peripheral sensitization here itself. And acute pain can only lead to chronic pain only if the intensity of your acute pain is high and it is a prolonged noxious transmission, right? So if you take care of the pain at this level, then you're very unlikely to actually cause the central sensitization. So if this persists, then it causes NMD activation, and that's where the NMD receptor blockers actually come in. It leads to calcium uh, flux and central uh, sensitization. So NMD receptor uh, antagonists, so whether you're using uh, a magnesium sulfate, that's where magnesium sulfate, that's why I keep saying, uh, use magnesium sulfate liberally. There is no problem with it. Or you can actually also use like ketamine. Ketamine has been used in, uh, uh, you know, as, as a, even a small dose, at 25 to 50 milligrams given before uh, the incision actually works fine. Uh, so it is it is important. Now, if we don't take care of uh, this aspect, then upregulation of COX-2 receptors and uh, nitric oxide synthetase uh, upregulation occurs. And there's further prostaglandin synthesis and cannabinoid break, uh, breakdown products are there. And this leads to neuro and glial remodeling. And this causes long-term potentiation. And this is what leads to chronic pain. So you don't want to actually do that. What you want to do is actually now actually just stop this happening. Okay. So if you take care of good care of pain, acute pain, you are very unlikely to actually reach the central sensitization phase. And like I said, using simple things like magnesium sulfate, NMDA, stop the NMDA activation, ketamine, uh, lignocaine, you will actually prevent them. But what's more important that it's not just taking care of the acute pain in the, in the intraoperative period, but make sure that simple analgesics are followed on for at least 72 hours. Uh, into the post-operative period. So continue paracetamol. It acts not only peripherally at act, act central level as well. Uh, you know, simple analgesics like, uh, you know, oral um, uh, paracetamol, ibuprofen, uh, or diclofenac, whether you want to use suppositories, that's fine. Uh, you can also add a small dose of tramadol. Okay, as I said, using it uh, a little bit of uh, you know, uh, opioids do, does no harm uh, to the patients. So in property, uh, 
preoperative pain, uh, then uh, continuous acute pain leading to chronic post-surgical pain. There are a lot of components, and here we can actually see what are the components uh, which are involved. So you have age, psychology, genetic, catastrophizing, anxiety, depression. So all those factors which we have discussed, uh, these are actually the patient factors. Okay, so I said that you have a young patient, female patients, okay, someone who is very anxious, uh, somebody who is depressed, who actually uh, has got some genetic as well. Now we can't actually take care of genetics, uh, but we can actually take care of the other components of the thing. We cannot uh, actually also take care of aging. Uh, we can ask patients to reduce weight. I mean, if there, are, as there is enough time, uh, you can ask them to reduce weight. Uh, but there are then surgical techniques and anesthesia techniques. Okay, so surgical techniques which actually are used, which causes minimum amount of trauma. I will talk about this later on uh, in part of the lecture or nerve injuries, anesthesia technique, where you use regional anesthesia techniques along with adjunct, which are the multimodal analgies here. So all those factors uh, can be actually taken care of. So uh, going stepwise, uh, so if you look at preoperatively, we need to actually look at preoperative anxiety in the patient. How many of us actually have enough time to spend with the patient and, and look after their, their you know, uh, anxiety component? trying to actually answer their questions, uh, holding their hands, making them understand that it's okay, well, the patient can be all right, we can take care of the pain, we can ensure that they are asleep during uh, the whole process, they will, so that is very, very important in, in the pre-op uh, settings. So we need to identify the sensitive patients. So I said, like I said, the Kalkman scoring system actually will help us. The type of surgery patient undergoing, that will help us. We need to prepare them to face the surgery and post-operative pain. Okay, they can say that, no, you are not going to actually be absolutely normal. You will have some discomfort. You might have a little bit of pain, but we can take care of that pain. We need to assess the patient face the psychological stress associated with the surgery and its consequences. Obviously, we cannot actually dictate what complications uh, can happen or not happen. But we can actually say that, yes, they, we have facilities to actually manage the complications. We have competent surgeons. We have, have units uh, which look after specialized patients, or we have intensive care unit or high dependency unit. All this actually has us to face psychological factors. Some places actually have specialized uh, facilities, and this is called uh, preoperative prehabilitation programs and they actually also have uh, exercise rehabilitation and uh, it is known that it's interesting that uh, light uh, physical exercise induces uh, inflammatory preconditioning and uh, uh, doing this uh, starting this exercise so even in patients who are actually not exercising at all uh, doing light exercise every day for a few weeks before the surgery actually induces the inflammatory preconditioning and uh, this actually helps in uh, preventing chronic pain. Interoperatively, we all know this very well. I'm just going to go this briefly. Um, multimodal energy or multimodal therapy is a part, whether you're using local infiltration or you're using uh, nerve blocks or catheters, uh, but you need to actually add uh, things like, you know, simple analgesics, uh, paracetamol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, magnesium sulfate, uh, lignocaine, a uh, bit of opioids if you actually need to use them. Use them, uh, you know, there is no reason why the, you can't actually use a bit of opioids. I mean, a little bit of tramadol or a little bit of fentanyl, a little bit of morphine, doesn't matter. But the important thing is that patients should not wake up in pain or should not be in pain. So these are just simple things like, you know, you, you know that some surgery are associated with, with mild pain, others with moderate pain, and some with severe pain. And, and you will accordingly, you know, use the techniques that are appropriate for that kind of uh, surgery. And, uh, for example, if you are actually doing, doing a major surgery, abdominal or thoracic surgery, you might put an epidural. Uh, but that is not the end of it. You might still want to actually use other multimodal analgesia. Yeah, that's why I'd say it is G-A-R-A-M-M-A. -M -M -A. Okay, G-A with regional anesthesia or multimodal analgesia. Or it could be simple, uh, regional anesthesia, Rama, R-A, 
MMA, regional CA, multiple. People tend to forget. You give spinal, yes, it takes care of all the uh, local things, but it doesn't take care of the other things which are happening peripherally or, or centrally. Okay, that's why very, very important that even if you give spinal anesthesia, uh, give them paracetamol, you can give non sterols you can give them magnesium sulfate, you can give, okay, if necessary, you can also give lignocaine, and you can infuse them, you know, over the period of the surgery and continue this analgesia in the post-operative period. So next is uh, looking at adjuncts. I've talked about them. I talked about ketamine. I mean, the evidence may not be very strong, uh, but uh, they, it does actually help. It does help. And uh, like I said, it's an NDA antagonist, so which is involved in uh, central sensitization, pre gabalin uh, This is, uh, again, or gabapentin has been shown to be very useful. IV lignocaine, uh, probably. And use of uh, systemic uh, alpha-2 agonist, I mean, uh, whether you're using clonidine, which is non-specific, or using dexmedomidine, which a lot of you actually use, are very good. Obviously, they do actually have side effects, but you know how to deal with them. I think uh, and there has been a case uh, posted on the group about it very recently. In the post-operative period, most important thing is unlearning. Unlearning uh, is very, very important. Managing persistent post-op pain, uh, you know, uh, you need to be aggressive. If the patient actually uh, present in the in the recovery and and says the patient has pain, do not actually ignore them. Say, oh, I gave a wonderful block. Uh, there's no reason why you can't actually be in pain. No, be aggressive with it. There's no harm in actually giving a patient a bit of uh, you know opioids. It might just be that patients feeling the numbness is exactly causing them them uh, you know problem. It's is causing them discomfort. You know, take care of that. So it's very very important that uh, the acute pain in the recovery is treated aggressively. And uh, it has been shown that using simple good post-operative pain is more than enough to prevent persistent post-surgical pain. There is enough evidence uh, into this. And this is a, a kind of very nice uh, study which uh, was done. And they looked at, uh, you know, what is the initial pain in the post-operative period. And obviously, if there's no pain, that's not a problem. But if there is pain, is this moderate? Is this severe? This is very severe. And accordingly, treat it. Uh, what is interesting in this one is that they actually have given what percentage you need to increase. So if you have you know, uh, mild pain or moderate pain, increase your dose of opioids by 15%. If it is severe, then increase by 35%. And if it is very severe, increases by almost 45%. And that's what is important is that they said you need to reassess the pain after two hours. Again, accordingly, you actually increase the dose uh, by, sorry, it is 15, 25%, and 35% in this case. In the, so if you already introduce, so if the patient is already on just simple analgesic, like paracetamol, codeine, and, and uh, non-steroidals, then you introduce oral opioids, whether it's oxycodone or oral tramadol or oral morphine, doesn't matter, you introduce it. And then once it has been given, come back after two hours, reassess, and if it is actually there is... Uh, no change uh, or the pain remains still remains severe, increase the dose uh, by 25% or 35% according to moderately of the or severity of the pain. And uh, obviously this uh, analgesia need to be continued in the post postoperative period. And they have shown this with this is the data from how they could reduce the moderate to severe pain uh, to uh, a, a good pain. And they followed the patient to almost six months post-op and saw that simple interventions actually did actually make difference. So most difficult part uh, of the whole thing is that unlearning by the nervous system. Once patient moves from acute to chronic pain, unlearning is, is difficult. And one of the things you need to make sure that you do not prescribe rest. Rest is bad for chronic pain. They need to be active. Staying active is very, very important. So physical activity or physical therapy is the most effective when acute pain is managed optimally. Okay, And that's why if you look at the most of the 
uh, you know, pain program. So if you actually have a patient uh, with knee replacement, hip replacement, the physios will come in and make them active. They try to walk them on the very first day, even sometimes on the same evening uh, or uh, 12 or 24 hours later. So this physical activity is very, very important. This allows nervous system to learn or relearn the functioning skills because when you had pain, you were actually trying to restrict your movement. You were trying to, same thing happens of the surgery. Uh, you are trying to protect yourself. If you have pain, you won't move. But if you have good pain, patient actually can undergo physiotherapy or physical therapy very easily. So acute pain management, very, very important. The next thing which I actually did uh, mention briefly was about protective surgery. A protective surgery like, uh, you know, preventive analgesia or preventive anesthesia, that is uh, similarly, you have protective surgery where surgeon had to make sure that uh, preserving the nerve roots is important. Uh, surgery that produces minimal inflammation is important. And minimal invasive procedure and surgeries are seen to cause less pain. And that's why people are actually moving towards, you know, most of them actually getting uh, uh, laparoscopic surgeries because the incision is small and that amount of, uh, you know, pain, the tissue trauma is reduced. And uh, this is called protective surgery. So protective anesthesia and protective anesthesia is very, very important. And uh, in case of protective anesthesia analysis, we, we actually introduce uh, our prevent uh, primary and secondary hyperalgesia, like I mentioned. And uh, we need to uh, also limit the uh, reactive state of the CNS. So also look at what's happening centrally. You can use uh, sedation or general anesthesia to take away the component of anxiety. You can make sure the patient actually receives drugs, uh, which actually act centrally as well. And potent analgesic techniques and uh, uh, along with the anti hyperalgesics are very, very important part of preventing uh, uh, developing patient developing chronic pain. So uh, coming to the end of the lecture, uh, so as summary of it, so we can actually look at patient uh, comorbid condition uh, environment, and so in the preoperative, we need to look at the patient's factors and try to actually address them. Okay, talk to them, uh, you know, allay their anxiety, um, make sure that uh, the patient actually understand what is going to happen, and you prepare them uh, for the eventualities. So you can say, yes, patient, you can be in pain when you wake up, but don't worry, we will take care of that. You will be prescribed uh, pain relief. The nurses will give you the pain relief. You say, yes, you can develop surgical complication, but we actually have got, uh, you know, facilities for uh, doing it. We have competent surgeons. Intraoperative and uh, post-surgical healing, uh, it be important that uh, the, there is protective analgesia as well as pro and protective uh, surgery. So uh, preventive analgesia and protective surgery are both important uh, part of this. And uh, this is important uh, uh, to prevent the pain progressing into the post-operative period. And uh, in the post-operative period itself, uh, make sure that patient uh, gets treatment for any hyperalgesia. Uh, there might be problem with patients who have had chemo radiotherapy uh, or repeated surgery or psychological factors. And these, there are things which we may not be able to take care of. And these are important that they get uh, the appropriate treatment uh, for that or appropriate analgesia. Like for example, if you actually have a patient uh, who's had chemotherapy or radiotherapy, you might want to use a little bit more aggressive management uh, like you know, as, as spinal intrathecal uh, opioids or catheters or epidurals. Um, so you need to be uh, aware of what are the uh, factors which can be uh, persistent in the post-operative period. And uh, thank you uh, for uh, listening. And any questions on this, you can actually put it up on the uh, Facebook, uh, our group, and I will try to answer them. Is there anything you want to clarify or you want uh, to share the slides? Uh, let me know, and uh, we shall uh, try to answer all those queries.